my name is Carrie Candeloro. My pronouns are she, her. I am currently in Astoria, Queens. And an image description of myself is that I am a white woman with recently dyed red hair with a little uh, caftan around me because it is humid here in New York uh, with a white wall in the background and a uh, patterned pillow and with flowers on it. Hi, uh, nice to meet you, Carrie. My name is Ken Stein. Ken Stein, I'm a 73-year-old uh, uh, white guy with a beard and a mustache and glasses. And uh, I'm in a room that's pretty uh, uh, beige in the background with some the tops of some, some uh, framed pictures in the background. Basically, as my own background, I worked at CIL from 1974 to 1982. Uh, as CIL's first public information coordinator. And I was also an assistant editor, the assistant editor of The Independent, uh, which was uh, CIL's na national quarterly magazine. And I worked for a number of years after that at CIL's Disability Law Resource Center, which became a uh, uh, a national law and policy center, uh, which has really I had taken the lead in just about every piece of envisioning and drafting and helping to enforce every piece of disability civil rights legislation in the last since the 70s. So I have a I have a 44 year history in independent living disability access and disability rights. I retired in 2013. Um, and my wife is uh, Ingrid Tischer is the development director at Dreadeth. And so I've managed to stay in the community uh, all these years. This is something I was asked to speak at uh, CIL's 20th, 25th anniversary uh, dinner in 1997, which itself was 25 years ago. So time does fly. Uh, people often talk about CIL as an it, forgetting about the many people who've made the organization tick and the interplay between those people and the success of the movement. For a variety of reasons, CIL's early staff members were people who could all identify mightily with the idea of independent living, even though independent living wasn't even a concept when we first got together. Uh, it didn't exist before CIL and coined the phrase Center for Independent Living. As Mary Lester described our early days, quote, I remember the enthusiasm and energy for challenging the system knowing that we were all on the verge of something big, undefined, unknown, but very exciting. Because of its goals and visions, CIL attracted talented and committing people, committed people from a wide variety of backgrounds. The Disabled Students Program itself grew directly out of the bonds formed of the Cowell Resident Program. UC Berkeley's Physically Disabled Students Program, PDSP, later named the Disabled Students Program, preceded CIL and was the model, really direct overlay model on which CIL was based. From the outset, there has been a commitment to the principle that CIL would be an organization of and for all disability groups, groups working together in coalition. And it was always a primary goal of independent living that people with disabilities would participate fully in the life of the community. Likewise, the relationships that were forged out of a common commitment to the civil rights struggle, struggle, which would attract so many others to CIL and to Berkeley. It was in the context of these relationships that a political agenda was defined and it's been continually refined and redefined over the past three decades. Well, now it's the past five decades or six decades. From almost the earliest days of CIL, the media has referred to Berkeley as a quote, mecca for the disabled. What they usually mean by this is that Berkeley is a place that people flock to because of its reputation as an accessible city. But we all know that the meaning runs much deeper, that Berkeley in general and CIL in particular is a mecca in the sense of its being the birthplace and spiritual center of the independent living disability rights movement. It's no accident that organizations like CTP, Dread of Corp, Through the Looking Glass and WID organizations that have had major national and international impacts in their own right are programs that originated at CIL or were begun by former staff. In the final analysis, what our community did was something utterly phenomenal. 
because what it did was to transform literally millions of lives and centuries old attitudes, not only in this country, but throughout the world from people being viewed as objects of charity and rehabilitation to people worthy of self-determination, willing to fight for and achieve their civil rights. I am very proud to have participated in this wonder wonderful history as it was and as it continues into the future. Thank you. That was really, really wonderful to hear. You know, it's important to have all this background information before we start getting into the nitty gritty. So thank you for sharing that. That was really amazing. So how did you meet Ed? Ed hired me. Great. CIL in 1974. Uh, CIL at that time uh, had was just getting on its feet in a building uh, as a real organization. And uh, it was on the, uh, and what was called the Krober building. There were only 12 people working there at the time. By the time I left, there were over a hundred people working there in a million dollar uh, budget and um, over 30 different units of uh, in operation. But I met Ed because he hired me. Uh, my first job was to be a, uh, Voicer for Hale Zukas, who was one, also one of the founders of the independent living movement. He, he uh, was sort of the brains before behind the philosophy of CIL. And I would recommend his uh, wonderful history, uh, Hale Zukas's history of CIL. And people can contact me if they want a link or I can get that to you as far as the nuts and bolts of how CIL got started. But that's how I met Ed. He hired me to be a voicer for Hale. Uh, which meant Hale has severe, significant cerebral palsy and people can't understand him. So I would go to meetings and tell people what Hale was saying. And also Hale would type on a selectric typewriter, sort of in code abbreviations. And then I would take what he wrote and uh, transfer it to, uh, to, to type. That's great. So I guess, how did you end up getting like, had you met Ed before or you just kind of walked into the room and just kind of uh, met him there? I guess, how did you kind of end up to be in um, looking for this kind of work, I guess, like just being there in the first place? Basically, um, I got a call from someone at CIL saying um, uh, it was a job. I, I was unemployed at the time. I had left a job I'd had at Bonita House, which was a psychiatric halfway house, and I was looking for work. And I had been a reader for a PDSP student uh, and she graduated. She was my meal ticket for several years. She graduated and I, uh, uh, CIL just happened to call me and say, would you like to come in and interview? So I went in and I got that job. That's awesome. I always love a fun phone call when it comes to interviews like that. I guess how would you describe the role that Ed Roberts like played in your life? How did he influence you, especially when you're coming into this kind of as a new, a new voice there? I think what's important is the impact that Ed had on the world. I was public information coordinator at CIL, and I had written a letter to uh, ABC News uh, for their weekend focus they had on their uh, evening news, uh, weekend news about Center for Independent Living. So uh, they came out here and did an interview. I was surprised 20 years later when it was the first time I, I audio taped it, that uh, Ted Koppel uh, introduced the segment. He was just starting out. And, but it basically Ed um, took people around CIL took the, and inter, uh, introduced uh, ABC News nationally uh, to what CIL was. It was a brand new idea at the time it was called the, I referred to in that letter as the disabled liberation movement, which I had not remembered that we had used that phrase, but we had. Um, and why that kind of thing was so important. And I'll give a super example of Russ Cooper Dowda, Reverend Russ Cooper Dowda, a wonderful person in the community for, for a long, long time. Um, but she was in a, uh, she'd become disabled and was in a rehab facility. And uh, the next day, she was going to be taken by her parents to, to a nursing home for the rest of her life. Wow. And the night before that was going to happen, she was watching 60 Minutes in her hospital bed. 
And there was a story of Ed Roberts and Judy Human and the World Institute on Disability. And it was the same kind of story uh, that, that we had done with ABC News, but uh, they talked about CIL and Russ saw that 16 minute story and her parents came the next day and she, she said, I'm not going into a nursing home, I'm going to Berkeley. And she did. And so I, I think it's an example of how lives were changed uh, so much. So when I'm talking about all these things, I'm talking about the house that Ed built and that impact on the world. So it's not uh, out of bounds. In a world that is overwhelmingly run on profit, greed, and disempowerment, it has been a great blessing to me that I have had the opportunity to have had my life so profoundly impacted by CIL. By way of understatement, I know I am not alone in this. One can't overstate the tremendous benefit that CIL has, CIL has provided, not only at home and around the country and around the world, but individually. The profound impact that it has had in each of our lives who have had the opportunity of being associated with it. For me, this celebration is partly a time of remembering many of us who aren't with us here today, but who are forever a part of the spirit of this organization. Phil Draper, Ed Roberts, Dale Dahl, Nancy D'Angelo, Greg Santos, uh, Dick Santos, Greg Saunders, A.J. Smaldone, Earl McKeever, Willie, Willie Winokur, Lynn Kidder, Wally Whelan, Diane Lipton, and others. I know that without exception, as much as they enriched CIL, each of their lives were inestimably enriched by it as well. I know that in my own life, CIL has been a blessing, but I also know that without CIL ever having been, this world would be truly unimaginable for millions. Wow, that's really powerful. Thank you so much for that. So you walk into your interview with CIL, you see Ed, what are your first impressions of him? What, what was personality like? What was your first kind of exposure to the man that is Ed Roberts? Well, because that was about 50 years ago, I have no recollection of the wall of my first impressions of Ed Roberts. <laughs> but I know that um, who he was as a person, my experience of him in that organization. Basically, Ed was the most positive guy I've ever met in terms of, he said yes to everything, leadership role and, um, so keeping in mind of what CIL was when I started and years later when I left to work across the street at uh, Disability Law Resource Center, it had grown from pretty much nothing and a first of its kind in the world to something that people were looking to as a model uh, to build on that model, people, organizations from all, all over the country. And the thing was, he said, when, I'm, when I say he said yes to everything, basically, you know, you don't get to 30 different units in three years by holding back. Okay, so 50 years later, is there like a nugget of wisdom that Ed passed on to you that you still kind of hold on to to this day? Is there something there that you just like remember from all this time? What I do have is a tremendous appreciation of his can-do attitude and his ability to connect with all kinds of people and groups to get what he needed and wanted uh, for this cause that, that was huge. Yeah. Was he, was he always like that? What was, or was that something that kind of came as the years went on? What was he like as, as a young activist? Was it still kind of the same positive can-do attitude? You know, I, I, I really don't, except to the extent that I remember as Ed talked about, have you ever heard Ed, Ed Roberts' victory speech at 504? I've heard part, I've heard about it, yeah. I haven't actually listened to the whole thing, but I've, I've heard about it. Okay, well, I think at the end of this whole interview, I'm going to read that thing. Okay. And because I think best for this whole interview to end with Ed doing the talking about himself and 
how he saw the movement. And I think that will uh, uh, allow anybody hearing it to draw their own conclusions about what was great about it, because I can't capture it. Yeah. Is there any particular like personal story you have or anecdote that like just kind of yeah, speaks to you and speaks to who you kind of remember Ed to be? Just any anything like personal story about him that you like to share or? Yeah, there he is. Um, <laughs> I think this really is a, a typ typifies Ed. Uh, for me, it always had. Uh, there, there was a, I was working at Seattle. By this time, I'd been doing a lot of other things. I, and we were still on University Avenue, but I'd been doing a lot of writing uh, reports that had, had, had me move into that job as well as working with Hale and doing other things. Anyway, uh, he said, oh, I got a call from this guy, Earl McKay, McKeever. Uh, he's out in Hayward. Can you go out, check him out, see what the deal is? Let me, let me know what you think. And uh, I said, sure. I took Bart to Earl's house and uh, he's a nice guy and he didn't really have experience doing things, but he was game and wanted to work at CIL. So I went back and, and talked to Ed and I said, yeah, he seems like a real nice guy. And Ed said, okay, I'll interview him. So about a week and a half later, I'm coming to work in the morning and there is a, a moving truck in front of uh, CIL with a big drafting board and furniture and Earl McKeever. I said, hi, Earl, what are you doing here? What's up? And I said, what's up? And he said, oh, Ed hired me. Uh, I said, oh, great. So I dashed upstairs while he was down there. I said, Ed, well, really, Ed hadn't hired him. He would just invited them in for an interview. And Earl misunderstood. And <laughs> I said, Earl's downstairs. He thinks you uh, hired him. I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'll hire him. <laughs> yeah. And he did. That's a really cute story. I love that. <laughs> yeah, me too. I guess, is, is there a moment that you kind of realize that like, oh, like Ed Roberts is a game changer. Is there like some moment that sticks out in your mind that you're like, this guy is really going to change things? And again, I well, there is. There was one what I have to call a revelatory moment in my life. Um, and this one was when I worked for the uh, city of San Francisco, Mayor's Office on Disability. And one of my jobs there was staffing and running the uh, Mayor's Disability Council meetings. And there was a presentation from the, the Laguna Honda project, which Laguna Honda is the last, one of the last, municipal nursing homes, a huge facility in the country. And basically it was, it was not a good place to be. And so uh, a number of people had gotten together, uh, public sector, private sector, city departments, uh, housing providers, all these people sitting around one table uh, working together to enable people who were in Laguna Honda, who many of whom we were there had been just a short time or longer time, uh, we gotten institutionalized. And basically this was a peer program at its heart where uh, folks with severe disabilities, many of them uh, were with much more significant disabilities than people were at Laguna Honda, but as role models and also working with all these different agencies uh, to get people out of there and to live independently in the community. Uh, it was uh, on the heels of the Olmstead decision, which said uh, public entities have an obligation to make sure there's services in the community uh, for people. Up until then, in the early, and I'm gonna digress half a second, but in the early days of the independent living movement, uh, there was this attitude, we're not gonna talk about um, anything having to do with a person's disability um, the problems are in people's attitudes, we need laws, we need rights. Well, it became real clear, and especially after Olmstead, that if people can't find housing, if people don't have services, if people aren't getting medical care, all the rights on paper in the world won't enable you to live independently. So basically, there was a big lawsuit filed by Dreddiff in conjunction with uh, 
uh, uh, protection advocacy in, in California out here uh, to Sue Laguna Honda. And as part of the settlement, they set up this group of people to uh, help get people out of there and to uh, integrate services, find services and get services in the community. So here's this young guy, uh, a wheelchair user talking about the program and he finished his presentation. And I said, you know, I just gotta say that it is so wonderful to hear you talking about this because in so many ways, this is like the vision of the early center for independent living, a lot of services under one roof, enabling people to live independently. And I just hats off to you. And I can't even remember the guy's name, but he said, you know, Ken, that means so much to me, hearing that coming from you, who we all know is one of the pioneers of the independent living movement. And you know, all the time up till then, I thought of myself like a Forrest Gump of the independent living movement, that I was never a leader, that, um, you know, I was just like all these other people who were there and his calling me a pioneer made me realize that we were all pioneers in the truest and best sense of the word. That it's not that we were leaders, but we were out on the prairie doing all this work and getting all this done. And, and, and that moment gave me a great deal of pride in my past and all that I had done. Uh, so in that sense, uh, that was my revelatory moment. And again, I talk about not Ed specifically, but all of us who were there doing all this stuff. Yeah. You know, there again, not talking about Ed, it's not saying he did everything, but I think of Judy Human uh, once said that independent living doesn't mean doing everything yourself. It yeah. means being in charge of how things are done. So I'm not saying Ed was in charge of the independent living movement and everything, but the fact that he hired really good people and really wonderful things came out of it and the, and the disability civil rights movement grew out of that and that the UN charter for disability, all of that is just huge. Yeah. Do you know why Ed chose to become an advocate? Do you know like what reason? You know, I have no idea. He started going to Cal in 1962. The, uh, they had him they, they finally they weren't going to allow him in and because of his and his mother's great advocacy, they got him in, but there was nothing accessible in the community. And so what do you do with somebody with a disability medical model? You put him in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So they put him in the hospital and he went to classes from there. He had an iron lung at night. Um, and I guess portable oxygen during the day. I don't, re don't recall. I think that's eventually he did. But um, And so he was living in that situation. And by the second year, they saw, oh, that worked out great. We'll have somebody else. So John Hessler came. And so eventually more and more people came. It became the Cowell Residence Program. Um, but Ed was a fighter. He fought to get himself into college. Uh, he was really interested in African-American history. He was an African studies uh, history scholar. Uh, and professor and think at a college that he went to at the time uh, PDSP was getting started. Um, and I didn't know him then. I have no idea why he chose to become an advocate except from his strength and character. And, uh, you know, Ed couldn't do anything. He couldn't lift a finger. He moved his wheelchair uh, just with a stick, you know, with a uh, joystick. And, um, and yet he accomplished so much. And that's not to say he's an inspiration because we don't, we don't go for inspiration porn. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is it, it was, he just did all this stuff and was a very powerful person. And I think when I read you Ed's victory speech, you'll hear him talking about that issue. Yeah. Do you know how he, he found or how he created his support system in the disability community? It's it's such a really wonderful thing to hear you talk about all of the people that are a part of this. It wasn't just, like you said, it wasn't just one person, it was this whole community. Do you know how he, I guess, kind of built that community, how he found and created that system? 
Well, his personal support system uh, was his family, his brothers and his mom uh, lived around here. Uh, and personal care assistants, which are so essential to anybody with a significant disability. Um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, people started flocking to Berkeley, you know, and um, there was the, the support system he created within the disability community was expanding CIL to a degree where it could uh, support all these people who were coming and provide services. I guess switching gears a little bit to today, I guess, what what do you think youth, young disabled people like myself should be advocating for to help carry on Ed's legacy? What do you think of the next generation of disability rights activists? As far as advocating for, you know, just be there, be present. Um, be in, it's, it's like, so often disability historically has been a uh, invisible demographic. It's not, not recognized, it's not taken into account in public policy planning, never at the table. You saw that so terribly with um, the COVID epidemic where they're, you know, they use this blanket term, people with underlying conditions without documenting how many people with disabilities were injured or, or were killed. And, and the same with the vaccines, where uh, my wife and I, who are both vulnerable, my wife is much more vulnerable than I am, uh, were not able to get a vaccine for months. And, um, you know, they were doing it by age. Um, so much of, as we know, that it, uh, disability, even though we've had these laws on the books for many years, the media and the public at large still operates on the uh, charity model of disability, medical model of disability. The medical profession really has its head up its ass about disability and has always, there's no training, there's no understanding. When, when I worked for the city of San Francisco, they came out with this baby boomer report, which was modeled on a federal report of uh, what's going to happen to baby boomers uh, medically uh, mm -hmm. as they age without a mention of people with disabilities or an awareness of people with pre-existing disabilities and aging and how that would impact uh, yeah. this population. Um, the, the issue is finally the, the thing of just advocating for human rights and civil rights and recognizing the interplay of those two and how important they both are to have on the table. Uh, all of those are a half hour conversation, so I'll spare you that, but those were the main bullet points of what I thought would be important to advocate for. Yeah. Into the end of our questions and this beautiful speech that you've been teasing for us this time, um, I'm really excited to hear it whenever you're ready. Well, I'm glad to hear it. It, it is online uh, if people want to hear him saying it. And uh, it says, the following is the text of the speech by Ed Roberts at the 504 sit-in victory rally in San Francisco, April 30th, 1977. <clears throat> All right. It was just what, three and a half weeks ago that we got here together to begin talking about something that we knew that we could do, you know, we didn't come into this with weakness. We came into this movement to show strength, to show what we really are, which is people who have learned from people with disabilities, from people being considered weak, from people being people who are discriminated against daily. We've learned how to be strong and we've demonstrated that to the people of this country. We knew it and now they know it. We have a long way to go. We talk about a long journey. It's now been about, what, 10 years <laughs> since some of us have been struggling. And for years before that, there are people that will be long remembered for their contributions toward opening society. 
And, you know, I think these next 10 years together, and I don't think we're going to get it all done overnight, but we have one fantastic start. 504, and I'll just say for people who may not know, uh, Section 504 of the Rehab Act was just a sentence that said anybody who gets federal funds can't discriminate against people with disabilities. Well, nobody knew what that meant to not discriminate. If a bus pulls up to the curb and, and somebody is in a wheelchair and uh, the bus driver says, I'm not stopping you, is that discrimination? If you send kids with disabilities to, to far away segregated schools where they get a crummy education and have to travel an hour each way just to get there. Is that discrimination? What about separate but equal? Nobody knew what 504 meant. So, so and the regulations were never passed. In 1976, uh, Jimmy Carter was running for office and he said, oh, I'll pass the regs, which are already written by uh, uh, John Wodach and um, Ann Beckman. And, um, he hadn't didn't pass them. And so there are demonstrations all over the country. They were all either starved out or threatened out or it, it failed. Um, but uh, in, 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 in San Francisco at the federal building, over hundred people with disabilities and their supporters sat in for uh, uh, nearly a month, 26, 28 days, depending who's doing the counting. Um, and as a result got the regulations passed in spite of attempts by the Carter administration to weaken them. So Ed says 504 is going, oh, wait, one more thing. 504 became the model direct overlay for the Americans with Disabilities Act regulations of 1990, 13 years later. So that without 504, we wouldn't have had the ADA or it certainly would have been there in the form we have. So, so that's why 504 is huge. Ed says 504 is going to help us guarantee our own civil rights. And we have learned that through the struggle, we gain tremendous strength. We are much stronger than we were three and a half weeks ago. I hope not only will this record for a sit-in be in the Guinness Book of Records for you all to show your grandchildren, but you'll remember what you did here, what we did together. Winston Churchill once said, never have so few done so much for so many. And this example, this example of people loving each other, committed to something that is right, is one that I know I will always remember. And you know, there is nothing like building a movement on success. We have never been defeated. You think about it. Whenever we have brought ourselves together, whenever we have joined our various disabilities together, we find our strength. And it's important to note that the 504 demonstration was really the first time in history that a whole lot of disability groups had joined together uh, to end in, in this struggle. Our strength is in our unity and our cause and our strength is in our righteousness because this is a cause that we've all invested our life in. We have to begin to think very clearly that what we need to do is help raise the consciousness of our fellow Americans with disabilities, to help them come out from behind, from the back wards, from the institutions, from the places, the garbage heaps of our society. We have to stop the warehousing, the segregation of our brothers and sisters. We have a long way to go, but we have one giant step ahead. Together, we have achieved something that relatively few people achieve in their lives. We have learned more than anything else about each other, about how much we love each other, and that commitment, that dedication to each other will carry through the rest of our lives. We have begun to ensure a future for ourselves and a future for the millions of young people with disabilities who I think will find a new world as they begin to grow up, who may not have to suffer the kinds of discrimination that we have suffered in our own lives. But if they do suffer it, they'll be strong and fight back. And that's the greatest example that we who are considered the weakest, the mo most helpless people in our society are the strongest and will not tolerate segregation, will not tolerate a society which sees us as less than whole people. 
but that we together with our friends will reshape the image that this society has of us. We are, we are no longer asking for charity, we are demanding our rights. It's not unusual that a movement like this would have its real heart in this area. There are many committed people in this area, Berkeley, San Francisco, Peninsula, all of Northern California. People have come together and have shown in our unity is our strength, is our, in our unity is our strength, that in our division is our weakness, that we are going to see attempts to divide us so that we can easily be conquered. But we will not allow that to happen. I want to say to all of you that from the beginning, I knew we could win this. That at the time was the state director of the State Department of Rehabilitation. And I didn't see any of you waver. We knew that we had set a course that we all were gonna follow. We knew the only thing we could tolerate was victory. We are victorious, we are strong, and we will march ahead together and nothing will stop our achieving equal opportunity and the right to move about freely in this society. We will storm the schools and open them up. We will be sure that each person with a disability who has special needs has the money and the power to gain what they need to move them back into the mainstream of society. And we will assure a future for the millions of people who are not now disabled. You know, you come to think of it that we are assuring a future for a lot of people we don't know at all and who don't know what their future may be very similar to ours. I couldn't be prouder of us together and I couldn't be happier. And I cannot think of a better way to go into tomorrow, but with rededicating ourselves to the struggle that's ahead to enforce 504 regulations to open up more doors, to create choices for people, not the choice of segregation. I thank you, I join you, I celebrate with you, I rededicate myself to work with you to ensure the future. Thank you for that. That was really moving. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank you very much. One thing that I am keenly aware of is how many people from the early days are gone. Um, and all of us are getting older. And I, I think it's incumbent on all of us. And it's, it's good that we have an opportunity to, uh, to speak the truth, at least as we see it. And, and afterwards, uh, when, when everybody's gone, people will will draw their own conclusions, make up their own stories. But for now we have to uh, share our own personal truths. Yeah. 